a lot of people watched it, but nobody's watching day to day all day unless you're me and just love this stuff. <laughs> Procedures are okay, but we want to know where do you stand? And so I think the more that politicians stop trying to be politicians mm. and be people, mm. then that will engage voters. We reject alternative facts. So come on in here and let me educate you on the facts. Hello, hello, everyone. Thank you all so very much for being with me this afternoon uh, to have a very important conversation. We are going to be talking about critical race theory in HB 3979. Now, HB 3979 is very specific to here down here in Texas, but you know, we still give everybody the information because we want you to know what's happening here because then it could also happen in your state. And as we're seeing online, on the news, in legislatures, all across the country, people are discussing and attacking critical race theory. So I thought it was perfect uh, for us to talk about what is critical race theory, right? What is this? Because I've been going to school all my life and I had not heard these things up until recently. So what is critical race theory? Why is it a thing right now? And why do we need to pay attention to what's happening? And so I have a panel full of experts. I am super excited to be talking to these women and black women at that. Y'all know we love a black queen who gets the people together. So uh, let me bring up our guests for this uh, conversation. Uh, uh, Dr. Kenya uh, Manat, did I pronounce that correctly? Minot. My not, my not. And Ms. Denisha Cotlone, thank you all for being here. Now, Dr. Kenya, you are a co-founder of Full Circle Strategies and The Recollective. Uh, and Denisha, you are the Program Development and Theory Committee lazy, Liaison. I'm getting ready to say lazy. Nothing about you is lazy. Liaison for The Recollective. So before we just jump into that, can you tell us briefly what those two things are uh, to establish and lay foundation as to why you can speak on this topic? Sure. So, hey, everybody. Glad to be here. Glad to be in the company of Quentin Giles. I know it's going to be a great time um, because he is an amazing um, advocate. So Full Circle Strategies was founded um, by my sister and I. Also, the RA Collective was founded by my sister and I. So it's been a joint um, effort by the two of us. Her background and expertise is in public health. Mine is in social work. Our primary focus with Full Circle Strategies is to provide leadership consultation to organizations who are in a pursuit of becoming anti-racist. So if they are trying to center race equity, if they're trying to figure out how do we do this internally as an organization and how do we do this externally through the work that is very important to us, um, we come in and we help provide that support through coaching and training. So that's Full Circle Strategies. The RE Collective, we're super excited about, just as excited as we are about Full Circle, because this is really given an opportunity for Black folks, Latinx folks, um, AAPI, and aspiring white allies to really figure out what it means to lead with a racial equity lens in Texas in the work that we do. And so this is an opportunity for us to center our research and our practice around eight anti-racist values, right? And so um, we are stepping away from deficit models and stepping into liberation models and liberation strategies that can really help lift up the voices of communities of color, not just seeing it as a campaign ad, right, but really feeling it and meaning it, right? having leaders self-identify and figure out what their place is in changing and shifting um, the political landscape of Texas. And I know Danisha has some great things to say about the collective too. <laughs> Please go ahead, Danisha. Yes, um, it's been a pleasure and honor to help develop and um, make their dream, put their dream on paperwork and in the spotlight. Um, so the recollective for me, it, it's personal kind of for me because when I think about my experiences within uh, majority white led organizations and how um, me as a black woman often is labeled as aggressive and defensive and all these bad terms and not being able to show up as my authentic self, but having to be to assimilate to white culture in a lot of these organizations. So being a part of the recollective not only in helping to develop it, but as being a part of grasping the the wisdom from Dr. Mina and Dr. Baker um, regarding anti-racism 
allows me the space to be my authentic self within my workplace, but also be confident in how I show up in spaces. So I am glad to be a part of a program that puts this into other folks, BIPOC and uh, aspiring allies as well. Yes, I love it. I love it. It's the liberation for me, not just an ad. <laughs> That's what it is for me. Can we be liberated, please? Thank you. So we've established why you all are experts in this space, right? We get it. We know what you do. We are applauding you. Well, I am um, applauding you for the work that you are doing because it is work that needs to be done. And I don't know if anybody tells you thank you enough. So I'm going to say thank you uh, for doing the work in the space that you're in. So let's talk about critical race theory, right? Because we're um, <laughs> we, we we are looking for liberation. We we want people to uh, be consistent uh, advocates and allies of anti racism um, uh, and anti racism. That that's a that is a daily choice, right? That is uh, being anti racist is a daily choice every day. Making those decisions to not participate further, push, embody. Uh, uh, uphold, protect racism in our society. So what is critical race theory? Like just at a basic, basic level, like a novice, I know nothing. What is critical race theory? Good question. And I actually want to offer a what and a why, right? Mm -hmm. um, so the what is, it's an ideology and a movement um, that really focuses on uh, identifying and addressing how we counter systemic racism in our institutions. It was birthed through the legal studies movement out of, out of um, you know, lawyers, um, folks, schol legal scholars, I should say, um, is where this um, movement and terminology are first originated in the late 70s and um, into the early 80s. And so it has branched off since then into so many different disciplines um, and scholarly areas. Um, there is, you know, critical race theory. There's... Um, Latin critical theory, there is queer critical theory, there is Asian crit critical theory. And so, um, as you can see, this idea of really uncovering and talking about how have systems truly oppressed um, and marginalized people, right? Um, and how have their stories been suppressed and oftentimes invisible um, and, and and that invisibility is a product or a byproduct of the white supremacy and the whiteness that exists in these different institutions. So it's really like taking the rug, you know how you take the rug and lift it up and you see all the things that we're not supposed to see or not intended to see and it shines a light on that. And it does that through um, five tenets. So there are five different specific areas of focus when you're, when you're really thinking about um, the application of critical race theory, right? And so you're looking at this idea of how we see race as normal. We see racism as normal, right? right. We, right. this colorblind ideology, right? We don't, you know, I just saw a couple of stories this morning. You know, we all wake up and, you know, scroll our thumb through Twitter or our, our news Whoa. and see what's popping <laughs> in the morning. And yet there are people who are still saying, I don't see color, right? And so, the why for critical race theory is simply that because we have created historically, we have created this, this normalization of not seeing people and not recognizing their story and not recognizing their struggle and therefore not being willing to talk about racism and not being willing to name the different ways in which racism manifests in our institutions and in our communities. Um, another aspect of critical race theory that's really interesting to lift up um, is this um, focus on the counter stories and, and really lifting up voices of people of color, right? And being able to hear them and hear them tell their story. And what's interesting about that is as we step into those spaces and begin to tell our stories and lift up the stories of each other, it really does challenge the status quo. And right. that does feel threatening, right? And that feels scary for white folks who have tend to be in charge of these institutions for decades, for centuries, right? And so it's no one, you know, it's no, it's a no-brainer yeah. that as we start to have more intentional conversations about racism and how white supremacy is not just 
um, resemblance of the KKK or the Aryan nation or the Proud Boys or whoever we think is that bad person that does bad things, but it is embedded and rooted in our policies, in the decisions that we make for people in healthcare, in the justice system, in the educational system, and as consumers in this country. And so it's just, you know, it, it has been around and has been a part of scholarship for a lot of amazing people who we see and, and follow who have been highlighted in, in, in recent um, times in the media. But it has now become this mainstream conversation. And I think, uh, you know, I don't even know that it's that people don't understand what critical race theory is. I think what people are failing to appreciate is why we have to talk about how we undo systemic racism, right? And yeah. when we have those conversations, we create this discomfort. And then folks are thinking, well, what's going to happen to me? What's going to happen to my power? You know, what's going to happen to to what I do and how I see the world? And that's and that's what we're dealing with here in Texas. In fact, Dr. Kim Baker could not be with us today um, because she, uh, in the work that she does in public health, she has to um, create these relationships with other entities, county entities and state entities. And one of the entities that they were getting ready to engage and work with just called and said, hey, we need to talk about this collaboration because mm -hmm. we see that you're using the term white supremacy and we can't use that term. Right, like that's no, all this stuff going on in Texas. We can't, we can't talk about it like that. So, can we get on a call at twelve o'clock so we can talk about how we can talk about this differently? And that, that's the reality of what mm -hmm. faculty, organizational leaders, whoever people are dealing like this is in real time. This is happening, and now, unfortunately, this is going to be happening in the classroom. Yeah. Teachers. Principals and school administrators are going to have to be making day-to-day -day decisions about whether or not they tell children the truth about mm. the history of the United States of America. Mm. Mm. Not, not can we talk about it a different way? Not, <laughs> not let's not call a thing a thing, right? So, um, Denisha, can you pick up on that with, 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 um, because that leads us into right HB thirty-nine seventy-nine about uh, these teachers and principals and administrators. Um, having to make day-to-day -day decisions about whether or not to tell our kids the truth about the history, whether to whitewash it, whether to skip over it, you know, uh, talk to us about why um, this is this is actually very uh, detrimental to our kids. Yeah, so first and foremost, I just want to say that no school has required any teacher or any faculty to talk about critical race theory in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Not one. So let's just put that out there. Um, not no school boards Any school boards never said it. So this bill is really just a power play um, utilizing mm -hmm. their power to protect their whiteness is, is exactly what this is. Um, but just to get into the weeds of it, HB 3979 prohibits discussions on concepts related to race, sex, diversity and discrimination. So how can we talk about the history of the United States of America without talking about race, sex, diversity, and discrimination. Um, because all of that is embedded in our systems. Right. Um, and then it also goes further into limiting professional development and training for our educators. So educators, mm -hmm. I mean, school districts are not able to make the decisions on how they provide professional development as they Im daily, they daily impact BIPOC students and staff. So they're not able to create trainings or have trainings within their school districts um, in order to ensure and protect the BIPOC kids and BIPOC staff um, that they serve daily, uh, which is, of course, an issue because we know a lot of predominantly uh, people of color schools and predominantly people of color um, communities um, are constant people co children of color are constantly harmed within our school district, not only based on the education, but based on how they are treated when it comes to discipline and various other things. Um, so that's the, that will eliminate their ability to require teachers and educators to participate in that. And yeah. it also prohibits students from receiving school credit for participating in 
civic engagement. So going to the Capitol and engaging in the legislative process and receiving school credit for it. Mm -hmm. And it made me think about, okay, what about those um, student poll workers that Harris County and many other counties are utilizing and principals are able to sign up and say, hey, this is an excuse absence. They're doing their civic duty. Like, is that taken away from the kids? And me and Dr. Maya and I was talking yesterday and it it brung to our attention that this is a form of voter suppression. It's suppressing these students before they're even able to participate in the process. Mm-hmm. Um, and But the bill is to protect civic education. Like, the overall purpose of the bill is to protect civic education. So, how and why is that happening when you're policing how students even receive this information? Right. Right. Yeah, that doesn't really make sense to me. Like, <laughs> if it's to protect civics, Teach the civics, right? Exactly. <laughs> Teach the history. I heard a quote one time, and I, I it's it's been so long since I heard it, so I really don't know who uh, to attribute it to. So it's not mine, uh, but it was talking about the power di- uh, dynamic and what we're what we're seeing is obviously you have fringe groups or fringe uh, in in every movement, right? But in the majority of this anti racism work um that you all are doing and that so many of us like myself stand for and a lot of my viewers stand for is really what we want is equity and equality right we're not even asking for like a black supremacy a hispanic supremacy right a woman supremacy we're asking for equity and equality and the quote goes something like this um those that have been in power for so long uh uh only feel they feel threatened because their position has not made space for equality. And so when one is asking them to come off of the high horse and be on the same playing field, it feels like an attack, although it's not an attack, <laughs> although it is not an attack. So what what can we do? What what are what's the charge? What's the call to action? Because we can have combos and I love a good conversation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love a good tea time and talking about the issues and, you know, uh, these these real high level educational conversations. And then we can get good when we at the kitchen table. Right. But what can we do in real time to combat this? Like what what are some things we can do to make sure that the history is taught, um, that power plays like you, you referenced power plays like this um, are either not done in the first place or when they're done, they're overturned. What's what's the call to action? Give us something tangible. So we, to give context, we did a call to action um, asking, you know, communities to reach out to their senators um, because senators use the power play um, and added this legislation onto the Senate committee um, agenda an hour before. So Mm -hmm. communities didn't have time to come and testify against the legislation. Um, and so the bill has passed the Senate and it's on its way to the governor's desk, which Governor Abbott, of course, of course, um, he has stated that he supports this legislation. Um, and so what we can do now is really reach out to the governor and ask him to be told the legislation. That is something tangible that we can do. But also during a conversation um, I had last night with a group here in Harris County about the bill. Um, one of the young ladies in the meeting said that educate, this is the chance for educators to stand up and really Mm -hmm. fight against this. Um, we can rely on our teachers and our school personnel to do, I don't know, maybe a walkout or just do something that is, that fights against this, um, this attack on their ability to teach their students, um, the way they were educated to do so. And just to add context, there wasn't any conversations with educators. Like, there's no school associations um, that approve this legislation. Like, Mm -hmm. the Social Studies Department in Texas, um, Association in Texas, is against this legislation. There's Mm -hmm. no one relied on any experts for this legislation um, to become into fruition. So... Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is people made laws or well about to make a law um, <laughs> about the education of our students, mm-hmm. but didn't even educate themselves mm-hmm. from the educators that teach the students. That's what you're telling me? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm telling you. They actually, they the author of the bill mm-hmm. didn't even explain what critical race theory was as he laid out his legislation on the House floor. Mm. He's never read any 
fundamental readings regarding critical race theory, yet he opened his opening statement on the House floor was attacking critical race, critical race theory, something he knows nothing about. Right. And Do so, you, go ahead, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. no. And so their reasoning and bottom line for this is mm -hmm. to protect white students. They don't want yeah. white students to feel guilt and shame for the sins of their ancestors. And while that's never been the even the um, the the intention for critical mm -hmm. race theory, period. Right, right. Go ahead, Doctor. Can you? I, you know, you asked like, what can we do? Like, what 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 is the action oriented piece of this conversation? And so, I want to lay out a couple of things that they're using this terminology of critical race theory, but they that that is an umbrella term that is an easy target, right? This started with. Um, attacking Dr. Rihanna Jones in 1619, you know, her yeah. her work and her scholarly work. But they are also talking about like diversity trainings, racial equity, um, you know, anti-oppressive, which would include like how we talk about um, LGBTQ communities, how we talk about gender, right? And so this is like a huge umbrella of an attack that started from the previous administration right uh -huh. and what happened and what is currently happening is states are saying that they're going to take it upon themselves you know those states that lean toward the person that of name that we wish that we do not speak of anymore they're leaning toward his ideology to create at a very state level um ways to continue to promote this insidious way of holding on to white supremacy. Um, there are a couple of things that we need to do. Now that we know that there has not been any due diligence, there has not been any endorsement of any type of formal educational groups in Texas, right. those would be people that are potential targets for folks who are thought leaders and folks who are interested in seeing this be um, defeated, reaching out to those organizations, because you're going to need a strategy for how you communicate with your staff mm -hmm. on these school campuses. But more importantly, you're going to need a higher education strategy, right? Um, this is a long game, right? And even though I, I, I am in agreement when I hear that me just trying to become liberated and seeking out my rights has nothing to do with attacking you. But on some level, we do need to be prepared to be aggressive about what we want and mm -hmm. take what we need. Like that, like that is where we are because nobody's going to hand over power. Right. Really. Nobody's going to say, oh, our bad. We had it for 400 years and we're exhausted. And here you go. <laughs> that's, that's not, that's not, 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 no not time time. <laughs> <laughs> no time soon. Right. And so now that we know we, we this has been confirmed through all of these crazy laws that have been in bill drafts across the country. Right. We need to be thinking proactively about where do we need to arm ourselves? And I don't necessarily mean in a literal sense, but where do we need to be thinking about? We need to be thinking about higher education. Right. We need to be thinking about how educators and any other person who has aspirations to work in the K through 12 system, how are they being trained, right? Because on some level, we really do need to fundamentally shift how we're teaching and how we're talking about race in America, right? And so it may, it may stop some school districts, right? Maybe some very rural areas, but if we really build off the momentum of trying yeah. to build build this thing and talk to the people who we need to talk to, we can we can put in some safeguards in place, right? But I think in the longer run, we need to start rethinking about how we train and prepare people for the classroom. Because even without this bill, even yeah. without this bill, there are plenty of experiences and situations where educators and other school personnel are stifling conversations about race. They don't know how to talk. Right. They don't know how to address things that are coming up, right? Or they're being very bold and aggressive with how they treat students, right? And how they uh, perpetuate inequities. Yeah, absolutely. 
Absolutely. I, I love that. And I'm glad you cleared up the armed word because, you know, ever since January 6th, I use uh, 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 words like battle and war. But ever since January 6th, I'm like, let me let you know what I mean. I don't mean a literal one. OK. OK. Because we can use those words and we're not running up in no capital. Anyway, that's not about this conversation. I, I just can't get over that. I just cannot get. Right. Oh, them people ran in that capital and smeared feces on that wall. I just I cannot. Okay. Just to touch it again right there, though. Um, so this bill also requires teachers not to talk about current events. And if they do, they have to talk about it in a way that doesn't pick a side. And so when adding um, context to the legislation, um, many um, representatives asked, could, we, could the teachers talk about the January 6th event? Mm -hmm. And they were like, they can do so as long as they don't pick a side. And I'm like, well, how do you not pick a side? What, what, what? I mean, either democracy or not. I, I don't know what, what, <laughs> what. I watched the live for four hours. I know my pa. <laughs> anyway, thank you, ladies, so much uh, for really just breaking down what this means. Um, it is interesting the history of critical race theory, starting at such a high level, right? Uh, being taught in legal circles and, and things of that nature. And now how it has been brought into our mainstream conversation and, and to your point, Denisha, used as a power play, uh, more of a political talking point, people issuing and writing bills that have no basic common knowledge on the subject. Um, I would say to all of my viewers, that's why I advocate for people to get in office uh, because look at, look at how easy it is for someone with the power to will what they wish, right? Have no basic understanding or knowledge of what they're talking about, but based on a feeling and a perceived threat, then create legislation that we all have to abide by once it's passed, right? So uh, thank you for explaining that to us. Could you could you give us, um, just drop real quick, if people want to know more um, about what you all do, if they want to help or join or just reach out, uh, you know, how can we stay connected and get in contact with you? Right. They can go to either website, um, the Full Circle website. It's www.fullcirclehou, so the Houston abbreviation.com. You can sign up um, to receive any of our notifications that go out. We do put out a quarterly newsletter um, to, to just keep people up to, up to date on the, the national conversation of, of race equity and inclusion and how anti-racism work is, is shaping up. Or you can go to the collective's website, um, which is VRE Collective. So spell it all out.org. And you can sign up to, to receive updates on that. The collective will be starting their first cohort of leaders. And these individuals will be in a training program for a year learning how to lead with the anti-racist lens. And so if you're interested in being an anti-racist leader in your current space where you work or you're thinking about branching out or thinking about how you can help mobilize communities, hit us up on our website, um, get engaged, and we'll make sure we'll provide information and updates for you on the second cohort, which is exciting to say the second cohort good deal good deal i'm here for that i'm here again and we'll and we'll stay in contact we'll continue to have these uh mm -hmm. these types of conversations so please mm -hmm. come back let us know what you're working on let us know what the big things are that we need to be paying paying attention to and why it matters. So Dr. Kenya, Danisha, thank you so much for being here. Everyone, uh, thank you all for streaming. Um, if you're catching yeah. the video or only caught a piece of it, it will be on replay and you can always catch uh, audio if you're not a visual person on the Q with Q podcast. We'll be dropping that audio sometime later today. Again, ladies, thank you so much for being here. Thank, thank you for having us. For sure. A lot of people watched it, but nobody's watching day to day all day, unless you're me, and just love this stuff. <laughs> Procedures are okay, but we want to know where do you stand? And so I think the more that politicians stop trying to be politicians mm. and be people, mm. then that will engage voters. We reject alternative facts, so come on in here and let me educate you on the facts.